What do you remember about the days leading up to that storm? Well, <clears throat> leading up to that storm, we were very excited. <clears throat> uh, we had this brand new guy who's just starting a headline. Nobody really knew who he was yet. His name was Carrot Top. <clears throat> but we were sold out for the weekend. We were extremely excited. Uh, the first night was uh, Thursday, killed it. The next morning, we had a uh, live remote at the comedy club with, uh, I think it was Kix 106. Mm -hmm. We did this live remote, it was great. And they said, you know, it's gonna snow today. And that's what we remember. But then my daughter, Dina and I were sitting at the club and it kept snowing. It kept snowing. It, and then all of a sudden, they said, we may have to close the interstates. So I looked at Dean, and she looked at me. I go, I can't believe it. We're going to probably have to close. We've got a sold-out show. What are we going to do? So we had to close. So about 3 o'clock, <clears throat> Dean and I just went and hit the liquor cabinet at the, uh, at the club, got some Crown Royal and some Budweiser, and, uh, and we went home. And, and, and through the night, I mean, I would guess you were just in the same boat as everyone else, right? Just riding the stone. Well, no, we, I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, it was, it, we were, you know, on top of the mountain and we were safe. But, you know, it was lightning. It was thunder. I mean, it was snowing like crazy. It was drifting. It was like three feet in my backyard. I mean, it was just something. And the next morning when we got up, it was ice. And you know how it is in the morning when it just snowed. It looks so beautiful. And everybody's just drinking coffee. And then, phone rings. Worst call of your life. Phone rings, and I get this call uh, from the Homewood Fire Department. And those guys, let me just say this, Homewood Fire Department was awesome through all of this. They call and they say, Bruce, your club's on fire. And, uh, you know, nobody discovered anything about it. And uh, the, actually, the whole shopping center's on fire. And I go, oh, my God. Yeah. So what do you do? So I just said, well, I'm going to drive down there. So I tried to drive down there. My street had uh, big trees that are falling. So I said, I got to go. So I just got dressed up as warm as I could and started walking. And I'm walking, lived on Shades Crest Road, and, the, and the, it was up to my waist. How, how far a walk is that? Well, it's about a 15-minute car ride to where it was. So back then, here's the other part of the story. Back then, I had a I, right when you first first cell phone, it was about as, the size of a shoe. I mean, it was like this big. Yeah. And uh, so I had the phone with me, and people were calling the house, talking to Cheech, and Cheech would give them my number. So one of the TV stations would call, how is it? And I remember Scott Richards, he goes, man, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Robin Shannon from Magic 96, mm -hmm. They were on the air, and they were telling people to go out of their house and try to help me. So I'm walking down the street, and all of a sudden, my buddy of mine, Bobby and Kay Beecham, they come running out of the house, come on in, they gave me some coffee. And then as I'm walking down the thing, people would come out trying to help me. But somebody was coming to pick me up at Burt's on the Bluff. It took me four hours to walk about a mile and a half. And then... I finally got to the club probably about 3 o'clock, and it was bad. I mean, it was flat. There was twisted iron, and uh, the one person who was there that I'll never forget was Brenda. The fire department came to the comedy club. The comedy club was on fire. I was sent there to cover it. So they were spraying water, and in order to get over to Bruce Ayers, you know, I was walking through knee-deep water just to try to talk to him. And this, we had our satellite truck out there. Uh, you could smell the smoke. It was just everywhere and freezing at the same time. It was um, kind of surreal, to be honest with you. Brenda Ledun. And she was so kind and so sweet and so compassionate. I saw the look on his face. And the look on his face said, I just lost everything. And I just thought, I've got to say something. And I wanted to tell him, I said, man, you know, this is bad, I know, but it's, it's going to get better. You're going to build back. You're going to be bigger and better than ever. And we did a story, and uh, I mean, we all had tears in our eyes, but at that moment, we just, the only thought we could have is, 
we got to come back from this. Can you imagine, you know, his life's work was going literally up in flames. It was tough for the fire department to get there in the first place because of the snow, but they got there and they were throwing water on there, but man, what a mess. It's amazing how people will reach out to help. You know, it was so bad because it wasn't just a comedy club, it was all these other 17 other businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they were out of business, all of the employees for all those places. But it just is like uh, Nick from Jim and Nick's called me and he goes, listen, I'll hire your people while you're trying to rebuild. Just everybody who kept calling and offering help, offering help, it fueled our energy to come back. So that was pretty cool. But what is, I mean, I, I can't imagine, you guys had been in business for a decade to that point. Right. And everything you own is gone. You told me literally the only thing that was left was a cigarette machine you didn't even yeah, own. Yeah, I mean, it was, I went there and I'm looking, I'm going, damn. I mean, it's flat. And then we had a hallway where the restrooms were, and I look and I go, it's a cigarette machine. That's the only thing that really made it. I'll tell you one thing, I had a safe. And when I got there, there was smoke coming out of the safe. Mm. So I went to the fire department, can you get that safe, can you get it? And they opened it up and the money was just about to catch fire. And uh, so we saved a little bit of that, but everything else was gone. What's that like, I mean, for you? I, I can't imagine when you're looking at your life's work there, literally going up in flames. It's strange, it really is. When you have a fire uh, and everything is taken away, it's really strange, but what kept driving my whole family was, we gotta come back, we gotta come back. And then everybody that called us and encouraged us, and, 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 it, and it was tough. I mean, but with all the help from all the people, it, um, it fueled our energy. And the, the young comedian who was supposed to be playing, I understand lost some of his stuff as well. There's a whole nother side uh, to this story. I had the weekend at the, at the, uh, at the comedy club there in, in, in Birmingham. It was a big deal. I was booked on The Tonight Show that next morning. Back in those days, if you were a comic and you can get on The Tonight Show, I mean, your bookings are going to go up. You, it, it's a level that everybody wanted to reach. And uh, it was a great weekend to kind of get ready for The Tonight Show. I was getting my, you know, my set ready. And we had done a breakfast uh, kind of meet and greet. The morning show had a, like a thing at the club, which is not a normal thing to do. So Top is scheduled to be on The Tonight Show on Tuesday. Well, being a prop comic, his whole act totally destroyed. Of course, the next morning we would wake up and hear we, you know, the club had burned down. And I remember instantly that my first reaction was, oh my God, Bruce's club. That's all I could think of. And my, my guy's like, dude, our show. And it didn't dawn on me until, you know, literally a minute that, oh, my God, my stuff was in the club. I was more worried about the, this historic comedy club uh, that was no longer there. And I didn't think about my act being in there. And then I started thinking, oh, my God, like, I don't remember what was in there. Like, I had so much weird stuff in that in my show that things that I'd stolen, things that I'd just come across, um, things I don't remember that they were in there. And so it was just it was. Total terror. Yeah, it was horrible, and I was, you know, it was out of my, out of my, you know, hands. But it was still, it just the whole thing was horrible. And you know, we were stuck in that hotel for four days. You know, so hmm. even after, like, you know, I if I had gotten to go home, I could have just sulked and, and pouted in, in Charlotte, where I lived. But we were sitting in a Radisson or whatever it was for four days with the same people, and everyone was like, we just got to, we just want to go home. So he's got to call Jay Leno and tell him that he can't do the show because of the fire. You've got the Tonight Show, right? I mean, this is huge. And you have to call them and cancel. What, what was that phone call like for you? I cannot it imagine. Was it was horrible. And then, you know, and then, they, then he mentioned it and he took a picture of me up and showed me on the screen. We thought they had this guy and I said, club burned down. And then that Monday on The Tonight Show, Jay Leno says, oh, yeah, we're supposed to have this kid Carrot Top, but all his stuff got burnt up in some rinky-dink comedy club. Rinky-dink is what he said. So all these people that knew me and who came to the club called Jay and goes, man, that was a great club. He's a good guy. His family owns the business. The next day, when we come home, you know, everybody had uh, answering machines. Right. 
on my answering machine was this message. Uh, hey, Bruce, this is Jay Leno. Listen, man, I am so sorry about what I said. I understand you got a great club. Listen, if you ever reopen, I'll do some local commercials and help you promote it. You give me a call. What did and that mean to you? that's exactly what he did. When we did reopen, it was Jay on the set of Tonight Show, and here's what he said. He goes, hey, everybody, I want to let you know that the comedy club in Birmingham's reopening, Bruce and his family, uh, you know, it's, it's going to reopen. And listen, go see him. He promises, I tell you, he promises he's not going to burn this one down. So go see him. <laughs> and boom, there you go. And uh, so Jay, and then Jay invited us to go to his show, and we got to meet him, and greatest guy in the world. Did you make it back to the Tonight Show eventually? And, and what yeah, was that we like? Back, we got our gun made back, and I came out with burning down the house, and I had, I had uh, uh, like smoke detectors in the lids of the trunk. <laughs> so I made, um, I made, I made good use of it. What did that mean to you? You talked about how important and how emphatic you were that you were going to rebuild. What did it mean to not even a day later have the host of the Tonight Show saying, "Hey, I'll do a, I'll do a spot for it you." It just when you fueled open. everything that we were doing. I mean. There were so many customers who called, please, if, if, if you reopen, we'll come and paint for you. We'll do the floor for you. It was, uh, it meant so much to my family. It really did. What does that say? And, and w did you see that playing out in a larger aspect after the storm here in Birmingham? Or what does that say about this community? You know, you got people who are helping you literally just get to the, to this, the place that, I mean, while it's going on. There's good people here. Lots of good people. And it's not just what happened to us, but for Nick, from the, from the guy from Jim and Nick's to call us, all these people. When I got down there, a friend named Bob Carlton, who was a writer for the Birmingham News, he heard that I was walking. Guess what he brought me? You'll never believe it. It was something. He brought me some dry socks. And I'm telling you to this day, because I was soaking wet. I had everything. Bob was there. And we're, I'm about to tears. And he goes, here, put these on. And it's just small stuff where people. So then after I go through all this, I have no way to get home. So I'm getting in, I get a hotel room. And so my wife, Cheech, calls our neighbor, Jeff Watson. And somehow he had this whole pickup truck that he got down there, and I don't know how he did it, and got me and took me home. And, uh, you know, it's just little things, big things. People wanted to help. Do you ever think you would be here where you are now at this location doing what you're doing all these years later if you hadn't gone through that? No. I mean, I, I mean if, if we hadn't gone through that, we would have still been there. I mean, we loved that place. We loved that location. We had just signed a 10-year lease. It was going to be called the Comedy Club Plaza, but, you know, maybe God had other plans. And uh, the one thing, though, no, nobody got hurt with this fire. Nobody got hurt, so that was, that was good. You still have some mementos of, uh, you know, of this. Obviously, this is something that I guess, do you still think about that occasionally? Every, about that day? Every, every once in a while, but, you know, for a long time, we would just drive by, you know, and, and we had this really cool black and white floor. So I went and grabbed that. This was another piece of, I don't know exactly what it was, but I just grabbed a few things. And, uh, and then, of course, and I guess you'll show that later, was all of Carrot Top's T-shirts and all his merch uh, were there. So... Um, was he in Birmingham uh, when, when this happened? Yeah, he, he had already gotten the here. Hotel. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to show you this. This picture right here. This picture was taken the morning of the, of the sub. When we were having the remote, Lori Grimes from Kix 106 took this picture, and uh, she wrote this thing. It was a cold day in hell, but we'll be back and better. So that's what it looked like. But it was stuff like that. We'll be back. I can see that gets to you. They believed as well. And you know, <laughs> I got to tell you another funny part of the story. The next week, we had Carrot Top this week. Then the next week, we had already done the commercial. Dean and I got this commercial done. And I promise you, 
This is the truth. Next week here at the Comedy Club, it's Tommy Blaze. He'll set the stage on fire. <laughs> I swear to you, we had that convert. He'll set the stage on fire. Tommy Blaze. Did they run? Well, no. I mean, we didn't shoot. run him, but that's <laughs> the next guy we had. Uh, sounds like even God has a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> but we just feel very fortunate uh, to be back, and we thank you and everybody who has supported us and all the TV stations. Really, for 40 years, they've been... In, They've been standing behind us and helping us out, and you know we're very, very appreciative. Uh, I've heard different names. What do you call that storm? How do you, how do you refer to it? As the fire, the storm, mm -hmm. and the fire. We, you know, we don't have a nasty name for it. Is it um, is it uh, is it one of those things? You know, if my reference point, having not lived here as long as you have, is you know April 27th, right? You don't even have to say 2011. People know where you are. Do you feel like everyone knows where they were who lived through that storm? March 13th, yeah. yeah. And a lot of the people were home because you couldn't go anywhere. You know, you didn't have computers and the Internet and all that stuff. So, you know, they were listening to the radio, watching the TV stations, and, you know, following what was going on. And, uh, you know, I'll just never forget Rob and Shannon were kind of like my guardian angels that day, telling people where I was and uh, helping them, you know, trying to help me out, so that was pretty cool. We started seeing signals about five days in advance, and computer modeling was very primitive in 1993. But, but there was this incredible window where even if the model was wrong, it was still gonna snow. How much, we didn't exactly know five days in advance, and I didn't have the guts to forecast it five days in advance, but three days in advance, it became clear that this was gonna be a, a potentially disruptive snowstorm, and we started raising the flags about three days in advance. And 24 hours before the event, I was forecasting 6 to 16 inches of snow. That was the forecast in this big graphic that I had prepared. But nobody listened because it was the middle of March. And everything was blooming. The dogwoods were blooming. It, it was in the 70s. And I don't blame people for not listening. It was an outrageous forecast. But we tried our best to message the fact that this is going to be very disruptive. It's very dangerous. And you need to make preparations. And people finally figured it out. Friday night when it started coming down. It was unbelievable. It was the biggest snow event of my lifetime. The station went out and bought a refrigerator just so we could store food in it because they knew our reporters and all the rest of us were going to be there for an extended period of time. So about three days ahead of time, they brought in a new refrigerator and literally packed it. We started getting convective snow, thunder, lightning, snow, hurricane force winds on the ridges. And we knew at this point power is going to go out for a lot of people. And I heard back from Bill Castle in the field with his camera. Bill knows this city like the back of his hand, but Bill was disoriented because it was a whiteout. And I'm thinking, this is serious. This is really going to be bad. And when the, when the sun comes up, it's going to shut this place down for a while. And we've got major problems here. And so many people lost power, we couldn't communicate with them via television after that. I think at one point we had you know, well over half a million people with no power. And trying to get there and cover stories was next to impossible. You could only get places in a four-wheel drive. And even at that, it was tough to get there. So uh, it was so cold and you just had never seen anything like it. The official snow total for Birmingham was 13 inches. In a way, that's a little misleading. That was out at the airport. Parts of the city had 20 inches, almost two feet. And the drifts were five to six feet in spots. And so that shut everything down. Travel was impossible. You had people that needed to get to an emergency room. You had ladies that needed to deliver a baby. You had a lot of urgent situations where they couldn't get to a hospital. They couldn't get medical care. The National Guard had to be called in. You had people helping people in amazing ways to get folks help in a situation like that. Some elderly people, they had no food, they had no power, they, they could freeze. We dropped to two degrees, two above zero, the Sunday morning after the snow ended with a clear sky and the snow cover and light wind. And that kind of cold in itself is dangerous. It rarely ever gets that cold here. So between the blizzard conditions and the cold, it was a devastating weekend. While the storm was coming in, absolutely. You could hear it, you could see it because you know everything was blowing in front of you. And we had huge plate glass windows and of course could see all of that. 
Once it fell and that stopped, it got very, very quiet. We really worried about people that couldn't get out. You know, the shut-ins, people who had medical conditions, needed oxygen. So I remember we got sort of like an army of people who had four-wheel drives to pick up and deliver uh, needed supplies and medicine. We had a reporter in the back and we kept going to the reporter and, and, and at one point we're going to go and check on the guy and, and, we, and somebody locked the door and I'm thinking who locked the door? Nobody locked the door. It was a snow drift that came into the roof and we couldn't go in the back back there to check on the guy. But uh, we watched the anemometer and we were seeing these wind gusts to 65, 70, 75 miles an hour. Thunder, lightning. You couldn't see your hand if you stuck it out in front of your face. It was surreal. We opened up the phone lines because we were on the air 24 seven for over three days. So what do you do during all that time, right? Um, and we, we opened up the lines just to talk to people, to experience what they were experiencing. Today we have, you know, our phones with, with cameras and you would have gotten tons more than we could have ever handled. Back then, you didn't have that. This is our winter storm like in April 27, 2011. And we did have loss of life and, and we had horrible situations. Now for the folks that happened to be home, that had power, and they could play in the snow with their kids. It was the most amazing event ever. But for those that had no power, that, that were literally freezing to death, especially elderly people, the people that didn't have transportation, it was a life-threatening storm and it was a scary storm. And I, I don't wish that storm on anybody. It was heartwarming to see so many people calling the TV station because we were kind of a central location where people could say, I've got a four wheel drive, I can pick up diapers, I can get them to so and so. People were calling for help, so we were busy manning the phones and trying to match those who wanted to help with those who needed help. And believe me, there were people that they needed to get to the hospital, they needed oxygen, they needed life support, and that's what was scary. You know, you're sitting there thinking, this happened so fast and people didn't really have an opportunity to, to say, I'm going to be able to have extra medicine and extra diapers. So. I remember we were on, on, on a Sunday morning <laughs> and two things that I, I did, we were talking to people and I said, just remember we're here with you, everything's gonna be okay. Secondly, I want you to know, remember that if you normally tithe to your church, make sure you send in the tithe. And I had ministers <laughs> going, thank you. <laughs> Getting the word out basically was commercial television and commercial radio. And I do the weather on a number of radio stations here. And I will say the radio folks were angels because so many people could not watch us on television because they had no power. But they had a little battery operated radio. And the radio people did an amazing job getting people through that entire event. But so the messaging had to be through commercial television, which was limited because of the power outages and radio stations. And we just stayed on and on and on and on. And People make a, a, a lot of jokes about television media and, and what we do. I think deep down inside, that's why we do what we do, that there comes a moment when we're needed. There comes a moment when we can make a difference. There comes a moment when we say, this is why I chose to do what I do. On Sunday morning, and of course we were trapped, we couldn't go anywhere. On Sunday morning, I decided I'm gonna go out there and dig my car out. The snow drifts were over the car, but I'm gonna drive my car out and I'm gonna go check on my family. At the time we had a young son and my wife and we were in an apartment building a house and it was kind of a complex time. After two hours, uh-uh. I mean, I know why people die of a heart attack shoveling snow. I've never had that experience before. I feel like I made no progress at all in two hours out there. So I just finally gave up. I think it was sort of like, it must be like being in the army and, and I've never experienced that, but we literally slept in shifts. We slept uh, barrack style. We all just had either, you know, our, our bed linens that we'd brought or a sleeping bag or whatever. They were just lined up side by side. We had a couple of showers available to us through the general manager's office and another one in the building, and we used those. And I remember one time we were so tired of sandwiches by the end of this period that you were finally able to travel just a little bit. And I got in the car with one of our photographers and we drove down to what used to be a grocery store at the Palisades in Homewood. And actually, I think it's technically it's in, it's in Birmingham. I bought up every piece of chicken that they had left. I bought up bags of potatoes and aluminum foil. 
This is Mama Pam. We go back and I said, form an assembly line. Everybody wrapped up their own potato. We threw it into, we, we also had grills at the station. So we threw the potatoes in the coals and we took all the chicken and literally just piled it on top of each other, poured sauce over it. And we said, okay, at 10 o'clock tonight, we can have a meal. And we did, and it was the best tasting meal. Of course, you know, the funniest part was Country Boy Eddie called me, the legend of local television. He couldn't come to work because he was snowed in. I had to host the Country Boy Eddie show the Monday morning after the blizzard. Worst hour of local television ever. But we made it through that, and right after that, that's when temperatures got a little above freezing. I remember having to walk home from work finally after a 24-hour shift. And it was, believe me, it was about a mile, and it was hard because the snow was up over my knees. I thought, I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to make it. Got home. There's no power. There's no heat. There's no way to cook food. But that's okay. At least, you know, I had made it home. When I came home, I had 11 people in my house because my husband said, what was I going to do? I couldn't leave them out there. So he brought them in and, and I mean, we knew them, but they were neighbors and friends. Uh, and he and these neighbors were cooking on in my kitchen. And you know, there was a grandmother sitting by the fire. I mean, it was a really strange moment. You had a 180 knot jet that spun up this surface low in the Gulf of Mexico, deep, 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 deep surface low, almost like a hurricane and you had that in the Gulf of Mexico and we were having cold air advection. We had pretty good pool of cold air from the north coming in here and on top of that we had dynamic cooling, cold air coming in from above. So we had the convective snow in Florida in the warm sector, they had a tornado outbreak. So the whole thing was just devastating and it went right up the eastern seaboard for the entire eastern part of the country. They will never forget the super storm of the century, the blizzard of 93. And this is truly generational. Uh, I, generational by my definitions is once every 40 years, it might be another hundred years before we see a storm like that. It'll happen one day, but it's not going to be on my watch. I'll be at Elmwood Cemetery when it happens.